Hit it. What? Aim it down, hit it. <laughs> hit, hit it harder. Yeah. It's called emergency repair procedure number one. ועניין היות האדם לבדו, היינו להיות הכל המשכה בבחינת גילוי מלמעלה, שזה סוד אדם עליון. When he was alone, what that means is that there was only revelation from above to below. שמה. כן, אדם עליון, שמה, that's the name of the equals 45, אדם, אדם לבדו, על הכיסא, דמות כמראה אדם, and here we also see that the, on the chariot, there's a vision or a, an image of a man, form of a man. All this means that that's the way Hashem reveals uh, himself as a, in this form. Uh, revealing in the sense of uh, the intellectual revelation is in the form of a man. Not the not some kind of physical revelation. And levado really means self-sufficient. When you say that man was alone, what you mean to say is that things are happening from within him. It's not as a result of interaction. It's not as a result. I mean, he's, he's like self-sufficient. We talked about this yesterday, right? That the uh, people that want to be self-sufficient, they want to be like Adam and Rishon. They, they, that's what they imagine, really. The whole... There's a guy I watch on uh, YouTube. I really like his uh, videos. He's called My Self-Reliance. What does he do all day? He bought a plot of land somewhere in... Uh, in Ontario, I think about it, I guess it's like an hour and a half or two hours from Toronto, or as they say, Toronto. <laughs> and um, and it's it's a township that doesn't have any. There's no laws. You, basically, when you buy the land, you can do anything you want with it. There's no bylaws, and you don't have to give. So he builds his cabin and his this and his sauna and everything he needs. He builds and he does. But he's alone there. He's married, but his wife doesn't think that this is normal, or at least not normal enough. She, she thinks he's crazy, basically. And uh, so she doesn't live with him. He lives there alone, and she comes once in a while. I guess they're still married. But, what's, but he calls it my self-reliance, like he wants to be entirely self-reliant. So one time he, he actually confessed, and he said, there's no such thing today. Nobody can be entirely self-reliant. There's no such thing in the Western world. I don't know about the you know, backwater countries. But in a sense, he has a, he has a dream of Adam Rishon. That's, that's what he wants to be like. And Adam Rishon, not just Adam Rishon, but Adam Rishon, as he was levado, like entirely alone. That's self-sufficiency, that's self-reliance. It's not, there's something not normal about it if that's how you live entirely. Because you have to be with other people. You have to rely on other things because at least... For the very minimum of, re, of 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 reflected light, of something of having a limit to who you are, can, and having some kind of something that will limit you, and not not cause you to think that it's you and there's nothing else in the world. Um, it's very interesting. Somebody asked, "Why did Hashem?" Um, somebody asked in one of the groups on Facebook, "Why did Hashem? Why was the only solution?" to man having eaten from the tree of, of knowledge to have him die instead of, for instance, um, what were the options he gave? I don't know, he gave some other options about what would save him from, from not being worshipped. Because Rashi says that he couldn't eat from the tree of life because then he would be like a god and he would be worshipped. It's kind of a strange question because the Torah is not just interested in how other people are going to see you. In fact, I don't know how much the Torah is interested in that. The Torah is really interested, first of all, about how you see yourself. The main problem with man living forever after that is that he would be convinced that he's a god. <laughs> That's the main issue. <laughs> That's what he means. It's the same idea here. Lo tov adam levado means that if you were immortal... You would be convinced you're a god. Some people are already convinced that they're not. You can, and then Hashem has to kill them because, uh, in a certain sense, they're living a lie their whole lives. Not in, in a certain sense. They're, they're, they're completely engrossed in that lie. I don't think today people are so engrossed in it. But you take people like Nebuchadnezzar. 
It's crazy. Mom is crazy. Paro. The, 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 the rulers of these kingdoms were, were gods in their own eyes. They didn't think they would die. Do you have another one in uh, North Korea? Okay. There's all these Mishugayim um, everywhere. There's all the stamp people that are crazy. They don't understand. The moment that the person doesn't live with clear knowledge that he is limited in his life, in his abilities, and whatever. So he's a god in his own eyes anyway. And he's worshipping a false god anyway. <laughs> that's, why, that's why the teenage years are so difficult, which today end somewhere around 50. <laughs> they start somewhere around 11, they end somewhere around 50 or 60 when the person first gets, starts getting ill. Um, because a person has this uh, image that I'm going to live forever. There's a song like that. Yeah. There's a famous uh, TV series in the late 70s, early 80s called Fame. The title song was Fame, I'm Going to Live Forever. <laughs> and then, of course, I'm going to learn how to fly, high, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Why? Because it all stems from the same self-worship. And the self-worship comes from youth. Adam was 20 years old when he was created. So of course he was a, like a teenager. <laughs> Where did he get his 20 years old? The Medjur says that. That makes sense. He wasn't born as a baby. Because right away he... Say yeah. that. So the important thing here is that that if it's like Adam Ha'alyon, if it's like Hashem's form, as it were, as it's revealed to us, so Hashem didn't want it. Who's described as being like this? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu had Yichud Ha'ila. He knew Da'as he knew. He saw the world from Hashem's point of view where really everything is nullified to Hashem. That must be quite frightening. Maybe, I don't know. I've never, never really felt it. Maybe hints of it. But Maishu Rabbeinu, that was his, his normal consciousness. And because it was his normal consciousness, so he, uh, he, could, he could see through the... That's what we mean when we say that his vision was like a transparent pain. Of glass, he didn't have the coating on the other side uh, when it came to his consciousness of the divine. So he was like Adam in that sense, and he's also described as being like Adam in many other ways. But because Hashem wants there to be a separate self, He wants there to be something that can do bittel and not just be bittel because it is. And maybe that's one of the big uh, mistakes that. We have to to work to get to Bittu. It's not something that uh, work very hard. You don't always achieve that either. To to what? And we have to work very hard. And we don't always. And we still don't achieve it. Okay. And therefore, as Selo Ezer Kenegdo, she a Ezer v'Siyu a Mipchinat Kenegdo Dafka. Therefore, I have to make for him a helpmate against him, or opposite him, like the coating on the on the mirror. Against him, uh, opposite him. The Hainu, meaning that this helpmate, will function as a limiting factor to not allow the divine revelation to completely fill everything. So from this opposite against him, which is not yet. Not yet the female, right? In the beginning it just says, Adam And then he begins to, the whole process, and so on. But in the beginning it's just a statement. The statement is, you need to have something limiting you. You have to have something limiting the divine revelation so that you can have a separate sense of self so that you can attain self-nullification. And from this, from this need, come about the body, and the animal soul, even before there's a, uh, a separation of the, of the human into male and female sides. Moshe Rabbeinu also loved. 
It fits very well. Somebody who has Datilion, somebody who has who sees things like Hashem, and the, the female doesn't help him. She doesn't limit him. He sees through her. Shem chinati yesh v'nifradim, and the animal soul and the body have a sense of being separate. Umizeh dafka yeah ezer, and this itself is the big assistance, the big help for the person. Ki me'elem zeh nasa achar kach or chuzer lemala mala. Because from this lack of transparency, from this concealment from this hindering of the expansion of the divine revelation, from this itself comes the returning light that elevates the person now. And like we said, it ele- if it wouldn't elevate him higher than what the neshama had before, this wouldn't be worth it. Meaning that in other words, the fact that you can get to a higher source than the neshama means that da tachton, that lower consciousness, that the consciousness that this is where things are and up there it's nothing. This is being and up there is some nothingness. This is reality. This is the reality Which can the lead reality? you <laughs> here. Why the, the, here is the reality? Because that's what every normal person feels. <laughs> when you're crazy you think they think it's not realistic. But a normal person feels that this is real. When they pinch him, it hurts. And he doesn't uh, make uh, all kinds of excuses for people to pinch him. So um, and, uh, he's still in, in, within reality. So this allows you to elevate, to attain a much higher state than if you were only the spiritual side, if you were only unhindered revelation of divine, of divinity. Meaning that the main uh, joy and pleasure that Hashem receives from the world will be from the actions, from the returning light. Those are the actions, the mitzvahs that we do. They're the returning light from there being a separate uh, reality of Elohim. Because our actions lead to the light returning even higher than the source of Vaya, so that allows a, an even higher source of divinity to be revealed in the future. And now the source of divinity is just Havaya. In the future it will be higher than Havaya. Lifnei Hashem. Lemala Mishem Hashem. Mosh Gatuv, Ad Yavo Amcha Hashem, until your people... So how do you read this? Your people God or until your people pass you, God. Okay? Meaning, what do you mean? Name Havaya. That the Jewish people will elevate even higher than the name Havaya, and that's why the tzaddikim will be called Havaya, and all kinds of things that have to do with that. And there's a whole concept that, really, what are we talking about? We're talking about the crown. If we're, if we're going to translate this into Kabbalah, Havaya starts from the Yud, is Chochmah. So the, the Yud, the four letters are Chochmah, Bina, Tiferes, Malchus. So the highest that you can get with Havai is Chochmah. Aye, but in the future, the whole point is to reach the crown. And like we've said many times, the Magid explained that the whole idea of Chassidus is to bring the crown down into conscious reality. So it's the culmination. Chassidus is already the Sachar. It's already the reward for all the mitzvahs that we've done over the generations. This is the new light, this is the Ol Chadash, this is the light of Mashiach that comes as a result of having toiled for so many years on the mitzvot. And it's called, the Keter is called Asher Lo Yashav Adam Sham, the place that is uninhabited by man because it's the super consciousness, it's above what I can be conscious of. And here we have this in, 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 in very explicitly. Atara means a crown. The crown that his mother crowned him with. That's how it's explained. That it's it's the same thing as Makom Asholo Yashav Adam Sham. Makom, okay, how the desert was described. Really what it's trying to say is that in the 40 years that the Jewish people were in Mitzrayim, they were in the state of, a, of being in the crown. They were in the state of... So it was like a time of Hasidus in a certain sense. V'nei achal chet adam rishon k'tiv kutanot or be'ayin. 
So after he sinned, though, the plan got spoiled. And instead of being garments of light, it became garments of skin. And the ayin is the external aspect of the aleph. Because before, the aleph, when it was garments of light, it was just a thin shield, a, a, shin, a, a, a thin uh, coating. It was, a, it was a, a body that was physical, but it wasn't a body that concealed the spiritual. It wasn't a body that concealed the divine. That's how it was before the sin. Because it says that he placed him in Gan Eden. Somebody asked this morning also, it's very, they're all simple questions, but I don't know why, why they don't, don't see the... If God placed man in the Garden of Eden, so where was man created? Obviously he wasn't created in the Garden. So where was he created? I don't know, it's a shot. It says he placed him in the Garden of Eden. He was created in Eden. Where is Eden? It says where Eden is. It's between the four rivers, which we recognize as being what today would be called the Fertile Crescent. It's between the Nile and between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers and the Jordan also. This is one interpretation, at least one of the rivers is the Jordan. But that's exactly how you would defi- define the Fertile Crescent. It's, it's, it's one-to-one. So that's called Eden. Where was the Garden of Eden? So the Rebbe in one of his sikhos, he brings a pshat, where in what part of the of Eden the garden was. If I'm not mistaken, it's considered to be the north part of the of the of the space between the Euphrates and and the Tigris. Wait, but I'm not. No, this is physical place. Here we're talking already that uh, something physical. So it wasn't. Of course, it was created in Eden, and he was brought into the Garden of Eden. Where, so it fits perfectly, because we know where was he created, according to Chazal, because Chazal also not, know how to read Pshat. So, where, so within Eden was created. Where in Eden? In Maria, in the place of the Mizbech. That's where he was created. He was brought, apparently, northward, towards uh, that area between the Euphrates and the Tigris, and that's uh, somewhere in Iraq or Syria. Okay. Okay.